We shall now turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17 and verses 14 to 21. This is a passage that we began looking at last Lord's Day. One more time we will take note of some important topics such as faith, prayer and fasting. And so please come with me and we look at this passage. Matthew chapter 17 verses 14 to 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire, and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long? shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit is this kind, goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. A passage of incredible Lessons on faith. What exactly is to live in faith and serve God in faith and be all that God wants us to be and do all that God wants us to do by faith. It all began with this man coming to Christ for the deliverance of his son who was tremendously tormented by demon possession. He was a lunatic. He couldn't think right. And he had fits falling into fire and also sometimes into water. And he hurt himself. I've taken you to Mark chapter 9 where we have the parallel passage last Lord's Day and show you some of the details of this man's sufferings. I also mentioned this to you. We don't know how to interpret this boy's, uh, this young man's troubles. Is it a medical issue? Obviously it is not. Because in verse 18, we notice that Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. So that young boy, you might say, young boy, uh, was completely delivered out of his troubles when the devil left. So this was not a mere physical or organic trouble. This was a spiritual problem that expressed itself through physical uh, infirmities and troubles. You know, I believe that not all sickness are truly physical problem. They may have symptoms of normal physical ailments, but they can, the root cause can be spiritual. Uh, there are two ways you can see this. One is truly uh, the result of your sins. God sends them as chastisement. If you read Psalm 32, where David cries out, uh, and he says, Blessed is a man whose sins are forgiven. And later on he says, God's hand was heavy upon me, him. And day and night he suffered. He had pain in his body. And that was because of the sins that he refused to confess before God. And when he confessed, the Lord restored him. That's in Psalm 32. We have other examples of trials of believers. It's not because of sins you commit. But these trials have special purpose of sanctification. And again, this purpose of sanctification uh, and uh, trial, I might say, uh, are actually of two kinds. One, to prevent you 
from going into sin. It's not a chastisement. In a way, chastisement is also a sanctification, but I already mentioned that, like in Psalm 32. But another kind of sanctification that comes by preventing you from sin. That's in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul says God allowed the messenger of Satan to buffet him, not because he sinned, but that he may not be puffed up. Because of abundance of revelation, God allowed a satanic messenger to attack him. He calls it thorn in the flesh. So he had a thorn in the flesh. It was not a chastisement, but it was meant to keep him humble, trusting. Even a spiritual man like Apostle Paul can become arrogant. He was not arrogant, but there's a possibility of being arrogant. So to prevent him from such a situation, to keep him in tremendous humility, the Lord allowed. You know, I have been suffering from terrible form of diabetes for now, I should say, almost 20 years. At the age of 35, I discovered it. And the doctor said I had it for some time, but I didn't realize. And even by it, at the age of 35, when I found out I have diabetes, I, I, I had no real symptom of it. It's because uh, my dad said, son, come and check your blood, because he had diabetes, so he checked it every day. And so I was with him, and he pricked my finger and test my blood, and lo and behold, it was higher than his. And he got frightened, and he said, now go and see doctor right away. So I had to rush and did all the check, and they said, yeah, you are diabetic. And so go on medication. Uh, this happened uh, when I visited my parents in India, uh, 35, I mean, when I was 35, that's about 20, less than 20 years, maybe about 18 years ago. And so that was the time it was confirmed. Since then, I was on oral medication, then slowly moved up uh, with the increase of medication, and it becomes um, uh, injection of insulin, started one in the morning, very small, uh, unit like uh, six or seven units in the morning and that was good enough but it started to increase morning and evening not only the number of in injections increased the unit also increased then it become three now I have to inject three times every day if I take a meal I must inject first if not the sugar level will just go up and all the complications comes with it are so many and I sometimes wonder, Lord, what sin I have to repent. Now, if I have repented sincerely, then I don't see it as a chastisement again. I see it as a prevention. Often the Lord keep me humble and trusting, crying out to Him for mercy. It is very tough, and uh, I don't know. I don't want to wear you down with my situation, but I can tell you, Honestly, there is a strength that worketh in me which caused me to rejoice in my trouble. There are times I'm so tired and weak and oh, I, I had to drive to preach from place to place. And now my wife dare not let me drive alone. She comes with me wherever she can, go with me. And she will sit next to me and keep on squeezing my shoulder, punching me. <laughs> and uh, say, are you sleepy? Are you sleepy? Sometimes we are talking and she can see me closing, me, uh, closing my eyes. And, and it is God who preserves me in all this. And I'm increasingly thinking, maybe I should stop driving because uh, I'm very afraid. It's coming to that stage. <clears throat> I can drive well, no problem. But just afraid. Don't know when this sleepiness will come. And, uh, that's a horrible thing. That, that's just one thing. And in the midst of it, my work in the church is never decreasing. It's ever increasing. And so, how to move on? I have never worried about this. Because God always gives strength and grace. It is tremendous. Only God knows how much help He gives to me. I can't even measure it can't even describe it. Well, you are recipients of whatever I do, and you better know it's not because I have no trials. It's not because I have no problems. 
I have tremendous problems. You know, this diabetic problem can cause a lot of other issues. As I said, I don't want to wear you down anymore. But I see this as God preventing me from being puffed up and being arrogant and being uh, faithless in times of life. Now, there is another kind which we cannot make sense why but for the glory of God. God has decided to take glory through you by showing his power in your weakness. There are children who are born blind. There are children who are born with great physical infirmities. There was a situation, there was a young a person who was brought to Christ was blind from birth and the disciples asked, why is he blind? Is it because of his sin? It cannot be because he was not born uh, to commit a sin. He was born with that blindness. So it cannot be sin. Is it because his parents sinned? God said, Jesus said, no. But then why? For the glory of God, he said. And God sometimes takes glory through our infirmities. And it is a mystery how it works. In that case of that blind man I mentioned who came to Christ, well, it was by his healing God took glory. So that Jesus may show that he is God. He can do that which is impossible in man. But sometimes God shows that glory of his which can work through impossible situation not by healing us but by using us in our troubles instance a modern example of that would be the famous story of fanny crosby you remember that she was born with good eyesight but there were some issues with her eyesight and a wrong medicine was prescribed or she put a wrong medicine into her eyes and she lost her eyesight. She became blind for the rest of her life. She was dejected, she was depressed, she was angry with God, but she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and followed Him and she produced 8,000 of her poems and hymns and some of it we, sang, we sing today. She was a joyous soul. Blinded physically, spiritually enlightened. And she could, she could beautifully describe the spiritual truths in the words of her hymns, which churches since her time continue to sing. And what was the purpose for her blindness? That she may not get distracted by the world outside, but in her mind she may be shut in to think about God and His greatness so she can beautifully express the glory of God in songs. So, my dear friends, there are many reasons why troubles happen. Now, having said this, we must also remember sometimes we have no idea of the troubles that come around us in this world. It's not ours personally, it's not part of the church personally, but the troubles of this world, which we also have to face, because we live here. If I have a non-Christian uh, neighbor who is demon-possessed, everything he does will also trouble me, isn't it? It's also my concern. If he shouts, if she screams, if he comes out and throws things around, the parents cannot control that young man. He is out of his mind. Recently, one of our residents in, in um, care ministry shared with me his problem. When he was on drugs, he can't control himself. He became a nuisance to the neighbor. And the neighbor had to complain. And, you know, sometimes we Christians have to face this kind of situation. We do have such problems, especially in care ministry, where we invite this sort of people who are under addiction. By the way, I want to tell you honestly, I with all my heart believe this addiction to drugs is a demonic thing. 
in many reasons. I, I do not have time to go into it, but just want to say that because it is not of God. It is surely of the devil. Such addictive behavior is like drunkenness, which causes people to go to hell because drunkenness is one sin. If you don't repent from it, the Bible says, will send you to hell. It's very clear. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. So anything that is so addictive, which takes you away from uh, sane thinking, proper thinking, is really a tool of the devil. And so we see some people behaving like lunatics. They are not thinking. Or oh, some of these people under drugs, when they come to us, oh, it's terrible to watch them coming out of the uh, you know, drug addiction, what they call the withdrawal symptoms. It's frightening sometimes. Sometimes they become monstrous. They talk to themselves, they laugh at them, laugh to nothing. I don't know what they're laughing about. They cry, hello, pastor, and they start crying. and say, why are you crying? I'm sorry. I said, sorry about what? Don't know. <laughs> it's just, just emotion all over, and they can't control. They start vomiting, they start to faint, and many other problems. And when we see all this, what do we do? What can we do? You see, one important issue that we need to understand when we study this passage is to see that the Lord put us in this trouble-filled world, in this demonic world, you might say, because the devil is the prince of this world, is to live by faith to do his will. How is it to be achieved is a big issue. A lot of people think, if you have faith, you can cast out all the demons. That's not what Jesus said here. He doesn't say that. But he seemed to have said that to the disciples. Uh, let's take a look. In verse 16, the father of this young person who was occupied by the devil, I brought him to thy disciples. They could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Now watch verse 19. So Jesus was informed that the disciples failed to cure him. And so now the disciples come to Jesus in verse 19. Said, why could not we cast him out? So they did try. The disciples did try to expel the demon. But they couldn't. Jesus answered, verse 20. Because of your unbelief. <coughs> Jesus said that very categorically. Because of your unbelief. I did touch upon this matter last Sunday. But I want to dwell a little longer. Believers having unbelief. Wow. The apostles of Jesus Christ having unbelief. That's exactly what Jesus said. You know why I cause you to read verse 20 before I try to explain verse 17? Because a lot of time people wonder whether in verse 17 Jesus was referring to the disciples or not. Because he said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long I shall suffer you? Bring him hither to me. So Jesus was saying something in general in verse 17. O oh, faithless and perverse generation. Did that mean the disciples? Or all the people who lived at that time? It means both. You shouldn't say it's not about the disciples. Disciples were included. And that's why I wanted you to read what Jesus said in verse 19 and 20, particularly in 20, that they were also, disciples were also, without the full expression of faith, which Jesus referred to as your unbelief. Now listen, this world is without faith. We know that. 
they deny the Lord Jesus Christ in general. But we Christians who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and start to, started to follow him must know what it is to live by faith. Each of us have our unique appointment in the Lord's church. There were disciples, there were apostles, I meant. The apostles have specific calling. As I mentioned to you last week, let me remind you this. The apostles were gifted with the power to cast out demons. That gift was not given to the entire world. It was not given to all the people in the Lord's following. It was not given even today to all of us. It was given to that particular group of apostles. And they were commanded to go out and cast out demons. But they failed to fulfill it at this time. In this situation, they failed. I think they learned from it because after that, even when Jesus went up, the apostles went about casting out demons and preaching the gospel. You can see that. Come with me. Just put a finger here. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says this in verses 11 and 12, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. I become a fool in glorying, I, you have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Paul is saying, you know, Corinthians, you badmouth me, you look down on me, you say I'm not a true apostle, uh, so I have no choice but to prove to you that I'm an apostle. I'm going to tell some things about myself, though I don't like to do it, but what to do? I want to show to you that I'm not behind any of the chiefest apostles. And then he says this, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So what was the signs of an apostle? It's not signs of a believer, but signs of an apostle. Signs of an apostle were that they could perform with great patience, meaning great endurance, in the midst of great impossibilities, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. These three words are references to miracles that Jesus allowed them to do, including casting out of demons. They were signs of an apostle. Now, you can see that again if you come with me to Mark chapter 16, the last chapter of Mark 16. Sorry, the last, last chapter is Mark 16 anyway. So, you get to Mark's gospel, chapter 16. Look at verse 14. Or maybe 13, verse 13 of Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 13. It says, They went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Now, what is this? This is about Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus resurrected, those who saw him told the rest of the disciples that they saw Jesus is risen. But they didn't believe. You take note of that. Neither believed they them. So, they is reference to the disciples who haven't seen the resurrected Christ, and them are those who have seen him. Now, continue. So, please keep in your mind, at this point of time, the disciples are unbelieving, unbelieving of his resurrection. They believe in Jesus, but they didn't believe he is already out of the grave. So, that's the situation. Now, verse 14. Afterward, he, that's Jesus, appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, which because they believed not with them which had seen him after he was risen. You look at the way it is expressed here. The, re, the, the, the hesitation to believe that Jesus is risen is mentioned as unbelief and hardness of heart. Can you imagine that? The apostles also had this problem of unbelief and hardness of heart. 
at that early period of their faith, while they are being trained, they still had issues. Jesus was not happy about it. So he rebuked them. Verse 15. And he said unto them, it's very amazing. Even though they had such problem, what did Jesus say to them? Amazing. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus said, I'm going to send you because he's going to fix their unbelief. He rebuked them already. He's going to, go, going to build them up. And he said this, you go and preach the gospel to every creature. Now verse 16. Please pay attention. I don't know whether you realize I was emphasizing the third personal pronoun, they, quite a bit. They were unbelieving. They did not believe. They were having hardness of heart. You remember that? Now you see in verse 16, he, it's no more they, but he, he is singular. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now who is this he? Those who will believe. He who believes what the apostles will preach. Remember, apostles were told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then he said, he who believe. As a result of your preaching, he who believe will be baptized because they are saved and they will not be damned. So verse 16 is particularly about those who will believe through the preaching of the apostles. It is not about the apostles. Apostles are referred to as they in the context. Okay, so you need to understand this particular passage can be very complicated, and uh, not because the passage is complicated, the way we think is complicated. We are sometimes careless in reading. So there are two groups of so-called unbelievers here. First is the believing, unbelieving. <laughs> what I meant is the apostles who refuse to accept that Jesus is risen. The other group is that the people who will hear the gospel through the preaching of the apostles and come to believe. All right? Now, watch the next statement. So often charismatics would take verse 17 and all that apply to all the believers. It cannot be applied to the normal believers like you and me because verse 17 is talking about they, not he, but they. It's not he who believe in verse 16. But they, now watch this. These signs, verse 17, these signs. Remember a while ago I showed you from 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of the apostles. Now these signs shall follow them that believe. Now who are they? These them that believe? is the apostles. Jesus said, you go into all the world and preach the gospel and those ye who hear you and believe and be baptized shall be saved. You remember that? Now he says, when you go preaching as my apostles, these signs shall follow you if you believe. So the disciples, when they go out, the apostles, when they go out, they must believe in the heart as they preach, as they attempt to heal even cast out demons, it will happen because God gave them the power. This is not about everyone who will believe. This is about the apostles who will go and preach. You and I cannot do it. Let's try this. Read on. Jesus said the apostles are going to cast out deep devils. Do you notice that in verse 17? In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, again them. It's that third personal pronoun repeating itself. Then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth. Who are these they? The apostles. They went forth. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And these signs shall follow you. So they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. 
Confirming the word with what? Signs following. Signs following. So the signs were given to the apostles when they around the world to preach the gospel. It was not given to everyone who believed. These were apostolic signs. Now think about this. Today there are people who say we speak in tongues because Jesus said those who believe will speak in tongues because of verse 17. But it says they shall speak with new tongues. New tongues is not gibberish. It's a new language you never learned. The disciples went around the world and they could speak in other languages. It's not just everybody standing out and just rolling their tongue. That's not biblical tongue. Now, how about this? They shall take up serpents. So can Christians do that? You see, why do you only claim one? Tongues. Why don't you go and take cobras and wiper and go home and put them on your bed and sleep? I like the charismatics to do this, you know. They only claim what they can play the fool with. <laughs> Pretend and make people think they are speaking in tongues. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> they think it's real. Why can't they take some serpents and go home also? After all, these are also signs. Of, no? We should bring them to zoo, Mandai Zoo or somewhere. You know, they got poisonous snake in the glass. We got, we got to put them next to it and close the lid. Let them sit there for a while and claim this because they are Christians. This is not for every Christian. This was signs given to the apostle. You remember once Apostle Paul was bitten by a snake and everybody thought he's going to swell and die, but he didn't. They almost wanted to worship him. They thought he's God. That's why he didn't die. But he said, no, no, no. I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and preached the gospel and many became Christians. So this was a promise given to the apostles. Special signs to prove that they are God-sent servants. Special servants. Apostles. There are no more apostles. You know, if anybody is claimed apostle, we have one apostle in Faith Community Baptist Church. Apostle Lawrence Kong. You know, the magician. He will do, must bring him. If you are apostle, take a viper. Let's see. If the viper bites you, you still live, then I believe you are an apostle. Or give him some poisonous drink. You Please don't do it. He would die for sure. <laughs> he will sure die. Don't do that. Don't test him, okay? I was just kidding. Please don't do it. So what shall we do? Every, every day because we are filled with faith and spirit, shall we all, instead of Holy Communion wine, we give you poison and we all stand straight. You will be committing suicide. I will be a cult leader if I do it. These are not for Christians to do every day. Just because you don't do it, you don't become faithless. That's my point. These were specially given to believing disciples so that they may be identified as God sent revealers of the truth. When they preach the word, the New Testament being revealed, we must accept that it is from God because it was confirmed by the signs that followed. They were signs. Signs are things that point to something real. Right? Signs point to, point to something real. That is real. You know, you put a sign there, that's the way to Pyalebar. That means that's the way the Pyalebar uh, uh, road going. So you go to go that way. So it points to something that is real at the end. So signs prove to the fact that these men were really sent by God with this word. And so it followed them. So please take note. I want you to understand. When Jesus said, there is... This faithlessness across the generation. He also included the apostles. And it was not about all the believers. It was not about the man who came to Jesus. The man came to Jesus because he believed in Christ. But there was this pervading failure in the world. And it is sometimes unfortunate to see coming into our life as well. You know what? You should know. As a pastor, as an elder, I have certain unique duties that the Lord gives to me, which is not your duty. 
God will never judge you for not preaching a Sunday sermon like I do. You will not lose any reward. You are not expected to have the kind of faith that I should have in preaching the Word of God. When I come up here, I must be absolutely sure the Lord is going to use me today. I stand in the power of God's Word. Because I know I'm called and equipped with that gift. And I must exercise it with faith. When I see there are pastors who are very hesitant to preach, even though the Bible says, preach the Word in season and out of season, they are trying to find a way not to preach. They are encouraging everybody to preach. Even the ladies also can preach. Children also can preach. In, in Kerala, in South India, where I come from, now it's becoming a fashion for little children to go up to the stage and preach. And what are they preaching? Nothing. Every morning they are given a microphone, they walk around the stage, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God is to be praised! Hallelujah! Everybody start clapping her. And you say, the Lord says to me, you all must be this and that. Hallelujah! Just screaming and shouting and there is no message. And they put the video on Facebook and YouTube. And I listen to it, I say, what is going on? They say, Holy Spirit gifted them to preach. But there is nothing in the way of exposition. Nothing is clearly explained. Just shouting and screaming and saying hallelujah. That is unbelief. You are trying to do what you are not supposed to do. Faith is not doing what you want to do. Faith is doing what God wants you to do. It was the duty of the apostles to cast out the demons. But they lacked faith. They had the chick to come to Jesus and ask, why could not we cast him out? Why could not we cast him out? It's like I go to Jesus and say, Lord, why is that I couldn't preach today? It's like an elder in the church who comes to you and say, I don't know. I, I don't know. He is in good health. He is in sound mind. He has all the powers that God has given to him all the time. And then he comes to say, I don't want to do anything in the church. I'm quitting. He is a faithless guy. Here is a deacon who comes around. And he says, oh, because of this problem, that problem. He's a believer, but he becomes faithless at that moment. When he doesn't perform his God-given duty. You may be a Sunday school teacher and you prayed about it, you sign your name on and the church count on you, but you come to the Sunday school unprepared and unwilling to teach and you are criticizing everybody and you don't teach and then you say, I don't want to teach anymore. You became faithless. Not that you lost your salvation. You failed to exercise in obedience to what God wants you to do. You didn't exercise your faith. Faith is giving yourself totally to God. When you are a father, when you are a mother, you have unique struggles in your home. You don't give it up. That's your calling as a father or mother or husband or wife. You give yourself ir irrespective of the challenge. It can be a mountainous task. You take it on by faith. You may not be the same kind of, uh, uh, you may not be in the same kind of family as others are. You know, I had a very unique church when I started as a preacher here at the age of, what, 25 or 26. It was a very small church. There's no proper system. I'm not saying there was no elder or anything, but it was not like today, well organized. It was... Just a, just a worship service in the morning. I, I had to pray. I had to seek the Lord. I had to share with Elder Ma and others in the church. And we cooperated and slowly we improved. At the same time, I had invitation from well-established churches of the same doctrinal persuasion. Come over. We need a pastor. Why don't you come over? We give you a parsonage. We have a car. You can be fine. But here is a church that has nothing of that sort. And at one to strive forward. And I thought, this is where God put me. I have financial issues. Church has financial lack, lack of finance. And we have 
lack of human resources. My mind is throbbing every day. Oh, must be doing this, must be doing that. We must have that ministry, we have this ministry. Oh, how wonderful, I should do this, do that. But there are, there are not enough people, there, are, there is not enough funds. But I stayed on by faith. I had my weaknesses, and I had to correct myself. It was a big struggle. So, you know, the Lord will put us in situations that are very different from others. There can be unique challenge like never before. Our church will face, my family will face situations that we never had before. I cannot quit. I cannot quit. As long as I have life, I must pray and try to do my part. So Jesus said, verse 20, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and you shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Yeah, this is a tremendous passage which has been uh, uh, taken on by so many preachers in so many ways. Sometimes it's very interesting. In my head, I think I should download all the messages in all over the world into a small iPad or iPod or whatever, and then listen to it. What do people say about verse 20 of Matthew 17? Or some people say, mustard seed. I haven't listened to all. Here are a few, which I know. Mustard seed faith means not a small faith. It's really big and powerful. Because mustard seed is those small, packed with strength. It is full of life. And so Jesus is referring to the fullness of life, packed into a small thing. You may be small, but you are ready to explode. So mustard seed faith means your very strong faith. That's one interpretation. Of course, the other obvious one is that you have faith. It has not grown to its fullness. It has not reached its full expression. It's, it's in tiny stage. I think that's what it means. Why? Because the disciples are still young in the faith. They are new in the ministry. The faith has not grown to maturity yet. They need to understand the task given to them has to be done by them by trusting in God. It cannot be postponed or given to somebody else. The task that God gives us has to be taken on right away. You know, what I need to do today, I can't say I will do it tomorrow. I have to do it here. I cannot tell you, can you come tomorrow? We will have Lord's Day tomorrow. It cannot be. Today is the Lord's Day. Today is the day of worship. I must be ready, irrespective of my weakness. I must trust Him. Today you are a husband, today you are a child, today you are a father, today you are a doctor, today you are an officer. You are there by God's appointment. Behave like a man of faith. But sometimes we do fail. Don't lose heart. The Lord says, it is not that you have all the resources it's not that you have grown to that great extent of growth that I will ultimately bring to you. Thus, the way you are right now, right now, if you continue to trust me and stay focused on what you are supposed to do, you'll be able to fulfill it because this duty of faith is given by me and I give to you so that you may accomplish it. You see, faith doesn't latch on to anything that God has not assigned. Faith latch on to only that which God has said, right? That's what faith. If you are going on into something that God don't want you to do, that's not faith. That's unbelief. So if I believe that God has made me a husband, irrespective of the difficulty I have with my wife, I just have to believe even though at times I've failed, I'm not going to give it up. I'm going to come back and this is the job I have. Divorce is not for me. Separation is not for me. Killing myself is not 
the, uh, uh, the way to escape. Or go after another woman. So I have two women. This one quarrel, I go there. That one quarrel, I come away. That's Polygamy is not my way. That's not divine. I know what is divine. Be in this house. Be a man like God wants me to be. I might have failed. I'm going to correct myself. And that's what faith is. So should every woman. So should every child. So should every person in the church. But when we don't do it, it's disastrous. Mountains will increase in size and in number. Interestingly, nobody creates his mountains. Mountains are there. These struggles are there. These difficulties are meant to be there. But God wants us to overcome them. God wants us to overcome them by His ways. By taking on whatever God gives to us. Now the Lord says something amazing. Let's look at verse 21. How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, what do you mean by this kind? Is it just about demon possession? I think the word this kind includes much more than just the demon possession, which was like a mountain. It is also our unbelief. Everything that happened right in front of Christ, the torture and torment laid upon this poor boy by the devil. How he was torn asunder before people. How he was almost tortured to death by the devil. And then the agony of the disciples. Please remember, people, the disciples were not disinterested at this time. They wanted to do it. They wanted to even find out why is that we couldn't do it. They thought they should be able to do it, but they couldn't do it. So I would suggest this. Christians, even though sometimes don't, don't fully fulfill their duties by faith, they, they are not without faith. There is this, this readiness to serve God, and yet the faith, trust, confidence is lacking. They do know, they do sense the problem. They recognize the problem. They, they, they agree there's a problem. They want to do something about it. And they even try to fix it. But without faith sometimes. That's the problem. Actually, all the devil, devilish things around us in this world exposes our lack of faith. The church, me and you, are sometimes called to duty by all the needs of the unbelieving world, which is tormented by the devil. But in the face of it, we sometimes run away and stand like frozen people, incapable of doing anything. It doesn't mean, you know, we are called to do all the duties in the world. But that which God wants us to do must be done. And if you want to be able to face this up, the demonic world and the pain and the agony it causes, and gospel is that which God gave to us, and we have perfect faith in the gospel, and we preach. And to overcome all the difficulties of this world, we must have great confidence in the word of God. And we, even though we believe, we sometimes don't believe it will work in our, our situation. You know, we read the Bible, we know what it says, and yet we don't want to apply it in our life because we think that's not the best way. How to over overcome it. It's real, right? I don't want to give you too many examples. You will be facing, oh, I am the unbelieving one. You better ask the Lord to work in your heart now. So many of you read the Bible, and you know that is what is written, yet you don't take it by faith. You give yourself into unbelief of what God said, 
and do what the world says and give justification. Yesterday, I was preaching in a gospel rally in of another church and I met with a doctor who was brought there by another doctor. He's a specialist and he told me uh, in the comments, actually when I was reaching the place to preach, I got this message uh, on my phone and said, Raman Koshi, when you come, I want to introduce my friend to you. He is a doctor, a specialist. We are partners in the same clinic. And he's an unbeliever. I just want you to know his wife just passed away in an accident. So he's very distraught. Please talk to him. I just Because I'm driving, I can't type. I tried to use that, you know, speech recognition thing. I pressed it. Say, okay, thank you. I'm on my way. So send the message. And I reached there. He was not there. Later on, he came halfway through my message. I saw him coming in and sat there. Later that, after that, I had long conversation with him. His, his wife's death was reported in Straits Times. Many of you might have read. She was also a doctor who went for diving in Bali. Because of pressure, she died. They got three kids. A young doctor lady, lady doctor, she died. This man is a widower. Last night I had an opportunity to talk to him. And I, he's not a Christian yet, but he says his wife believed in Jesus. She started going to church for two months, I mean two years, uh, before this tragedy happened. I asked him, why you don't believe? He said, uh, very philosophical, without going into all the details. Toward the end I said to him, now hear your opportunity. Today is the day of salvation. He said, I live for just one day. I said, good enough. If you were to die now, how? He said, yeah, this is something I need to think. I said, I hope you will come to church or go to the church where I went to preach or come here. Go with your friend. Dear friends, I stood there yesterday before this man, a very enterprising, brilliant mind. And I look at his face, I could see the sadness. At the same time, the confidence, you know, I am capable of pulling this through. Struggling in his head. I preach the gospel. And with all confidence. And he thanked me after that. And I said, can we meet again? He said, no problem, we can meet together. I want you to pray. You understand what I mean? There are much work to be done. There are many who are in such chaotic situation in this educated world. Doctors cannot save life. They also die in the pink of their health. What do you do without Christ? There are counselors, I can tell you, psychologists and psychiatrists who are in desperate condition of without peace, joyless life. They survive on psychotropic drugs. They secretly take and then want to be counselors. This is the reality I'm facing every day. Not only the drug addicts who went to Chang Changi prison, but even professionals living by, not by faith, living by mustard seed kind of psychotic pills. Addicted to it. Doctors, philosophers, professors, intelligent people. You are all given places of appointment to preach the gospel. Now you say, I don't know how. I understand. Start praying. With fasting. Lord, your, your truth, your wisdom, your spirit has put me in this place. In my struggle, in my family, in my church, in my workplace, wherever it be, it is full of troubles. But here, I am supposed to be victorious. I will not give up. Faith expresses itself by prayer and fasting. I want to tell you honestly, care ministry cannot go 
forward without much prayer. And all my fellow brethren who are serving in care ministry, you may be doing removal service, you may be printing t-shirts, you may be counseling people, you may be having struggles, start praying more. Because you have not come and rejoiced in the beautiful blessings of gospel in our midst by accident. God brought you here. And we prayed. It is by faith we started this ministry. Care ministry was an extremely difficult problem. Even our own people stood against it. Because they were worried and afraid. They said, church cannot do it. I said, if church cannot do it, then who can save sinners? Who can save the ones who are struggling? Rejected. It's not prison. Prison doesn't know how to save. Prison only knows how to lock up. When they are released, they go back into the world. Confused. Parents don't know how to look after them. Siblings don't know. Everybody cast them out. Why don't we preach the gospel? It was by prayer, pure prayer with fasting that helped us to start this ministry. And now all of you have come and blessed. Now you know that your duty, I'm talking to care ministry brethren now. You know your duty is to fast and pray. If you don't, you will be taken down by your own faithlessness. We had some people in the care ministry. They said they are called by God, having no faith whatsoever. They came looking for means to survive. They look at the mountain of problems. They quit. They went back to the world. There's one guy who left after nine years. And he one day called me and asked me, Pastor Koshi, how are you doing? I said, why do you worry about me? I'm all right. I'm worried about you. How are you doing? Okay, la. I said, what? Okay, la. You are in trouble. You left the Lord. You are in deep trouble. No, I am all right. I said, you are not all right. Now I hear he started to drink and go back the old ways. I'm so worried for him. What can I do? But I just want to say, if he who has been called by God through the gospel and shown him for nine years the beauty of salvation, it would quit. It is a perverse generation that has come into the church sometimes. If you have backslided, you better stop now. If you are truly believing to see the greatness of God to which you are called, start praying with fasting. That's faith. What do we pray for? Pray for everything God has called us to give us. The beautiful Christian that we ought to be. The fruitful Christian that we ought to be. The victorious Christian that we ought to be. A hopeful Christian in the midst of adversities. Pray for that. But not by complaining to a lot of people. Not by crying and wailing with our faith. But believe the Lord will use me. I will not quit. Pray. Even with fasting. Fasting has become an occasional thing to the church. But I say it should be in every man's and every woman's life. Do you fast and pray? I taught you to sing a song. Fast and pray. You remember that song? I can't remember all the words now, so I stop. <laughs> fast and pray when your heart is weary. When your heart is fearful. Let's rise up and sing. Teach me thy way, O Lord.